welcome, uh, Senator Sonia, Sonia Chang Diaz. Um, uh, the, as noted um, before, Zaida and I will be doing have some co-interviewing. We'll be trading off uh, between questions, some of them policy, some of them leadership style, some about just getting to know you kind of a little bit more. Um, but to start off, can you just take a few minutes, tell us who you, and, oh, and step back, You'll, we'll have 18 minutes total, so keep that in mind when you're answering different questions. Um, but start off, tell us who you are and why you're running. Gotcha. Um, thank you, Jonathan. Um, thanks, Progressive Mass, everybody, for having me. Um, before I dive in, you know, want to say uh, thank you and a special shout out to um, to all of the Progressive Mass staff, which is exciting to have now, um, as well as board members um, for just you know doing this, these labors of love and, and you know and organizing us, uh, keeping us on the on the path to justice. So, um, I'm, you know, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm Sonia Chang Diaz. Uh, I am a mom. You might hear my little ones running around uh, in the back here. Bear with me on that. Uh, I am a former public school teacher. I am Massachusetts first Latina and first Asian American state senator. And I am running for governor because uh, every day in Massachusetts, it is getting harder to live here, to raise a family here. Housing costs are going through the roof. We've got some of the worst traffic congestion in the nation and the fastest growing student debt load. Mm -hmm. Healthcare and childcare are getting more and more expensive and kind of, you know, hovering over it all are the consequences of climate change that are barreling down on us. And the truth is that leaders on Beacon Hill have been telling working families to wait for too damn long for real meaningful change on these problems. The fire that I bring to this race uh, comes from my past. My dad was uh, an immigrant to the United States from Costa Rica. He came with 50 bucks in his pocket, uh, but with the help of teachers and lunch ladies and librarians, he made it not only to college, but he made it to space and he became NASA's first Latino astronaut. My mom uh, is a social worker and a woman of faith and she spent her career helping women and children struggling on the margins of society. Each of them in their own way taught me about our country's incredible potential and opportunities and how the only way that we're gonna deliver on them is to raise our voices together, take action and fight for our best values. Now those lessons have stayed with me my entire life. Uh, working as a public school teacher in one of the poorest school districts in the state, Lynn. Uh, shout out to any folks on the Zoom from Lynn. Uh, every day uh, there, I came face to face with the way that the gap between have and have not communities uh, and Beacon Hill's willful inattention to that gap narrowed the life choices for my kids. And it's also stayed with me over the past 13 years as a state senator fighting like hell alongside many of you guys. Uh, for bold transformational change. I have seen firsthand that we have still got too many people in government, uh, including leaders in our own party, if we're being honest, who are more concerned with holding on to power rather than doing something with it. And that's why it's getting so hard to live and work and raise a family here. I'm running to change that because over the past 13 years, we have also shown that we can, in fact, win big, right? $1.5 billion with a B in progressive education funding. Criminal justice reform, police accountability, LGBTQ rights, all the way back when I think to Cory reform, right? My first term. So we do not have to accept the world as it's presented to us. I have seen real systemic change, the kind we all crave, happen before in our commonwealth. And that's how I know that we can provide a quality, affordable education to every one of our kids in Massachusetts from birth into adulthood. We can pass a Green New Deal to win the fight against climate change and create tens of thousands of good paying jobs at the same time. We can close the racial wealth divide, rebuild the middle class, make it so that our young people's economic fortunes look better and not worse than their parents. Together, we have already shown that this future is possible. It's my uh, ringing cell phone there. That's my ribbon, my cell phone. We've shown that this future is possible. We just need to stand together 
We gotta see each other's fights as our own. And we've gotta elect a governor who doesn't just say the right words, but who's shown that she will take action on tough fights, even when it's politically uncomfortable and inconvenient to deliver the bold transformational change that we need. If that's the kind of future you wanna grab with both hands, uh, one that you think is rolling, worth rolling up your sleeves for and fighting for with me, I'm asking you to join me. No one is entitled to this office, my friends, and I'm not taking any voters for granted. That's why our campaign is working, organizing, listening to people all across the state to hear about the change that they need and to build the movement, not only to win the corner office, but to deliver once I'm elected. That's why I'm asking for your support at Progressive Massachusetts. Few things would make me prouder um, than to continue on, you know, in, in the trench with you as we have uh, for years now. When it comes to winning real change for Massachusetts, the reality is we are not limited by natural resources. Uh, we're not limited by technology. We are not even limited by public opinion. Our biggest obstacle is a lack of urgency from elected and appointed leaders to take action in order to forge a new future for our state. I didn't get into this race because I thought it was gonna be easy or because I saw a, you know, a good career opportunity. I got into it because I have stood on the front lines with families across our state my whole life. And I know the urgency of the moment that we're living in. And I know the future that we absolutely can build together. I'm excited to go build it with you and to partner with you on this growing campaign. So thank you so much. and. Let's get to it. You know, I, I am counting on you guys to not hold back. I know you're going to kick the tires uh, and I'm looking forward to it. Thank you so much, Sonia. Um, again, a pleasure. And as a kid who um, grew up in Texas and Oklahoma um, and also a NASA nerd, I, I knew about your dad before I knew about you. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, you know, again, representation is so important. So it's it's amazing. So. Big, big fan of your dads. Um, but um, I did a lot of work um, as an organizer um, when COVID-19 first started. I helped organize a mutual aid group in the Malden area called Malden Neighbors Helping Neighbors um, because a bunch of people that I actually never had met stood up and raised their hands and said, hey, our government is failing us. What do we do? How do we, how do we keep our neighborhoods and our city intact? So I, my first question, which is again, dear, near and dear to me, is about the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, mm -hmm. How would you evaluate our state's response to this pandemic? Mm -hmm. um, and what would you have done differently? And how can we ensure that we'll be better prepared the next time something like this happens? Mm -hmm. All right, so I think, you know, most important to talk about the forward looking. So I'll just say, you know, very quick touch on the evaluation question. Um, you know, the fact that our state has, uh, you know, exceeded national averages on various metrics of, of uh, you know, confronting the pandemic, um, I think is, is um, in spite of, rather than because of um, our state government's response, right? We are the, a healthcare capital of the world. We have, you know, some of the highest educated um, and well, you know, most resourced uh, people uh, in the United States. Right, so we damn well ought to be exceeding the national averages by a long shot uh, when it comes to you know our vaccination rates and um, infection rates and the like. Although you know infection rates, we do have you know a more densely situated population, obviously. Um, so there are a lot of things we could have done better. And look, you know, in fairness, no one, uh, you know, no executive can anticipate everything about a pandemic like this. There are going to be unknowns, uh, but there were things. Um, that were entirely anticipatable, right? Predictable and in fact predicted uh, in this, this pandemic that we could have and should have done better on starting from the very first week of the pandemic, right? I remember talking with, with uh, you know, colleagues and grassroots leaders across the state in the first week or two of the pandemic and saying, you know, we know this is gonna, this is gonna be like a repeat of Hurricane Katrina if we don't do something different, right? And God, please, can we have learned that lesson by now? Um, and, you know, we've got to shore up our social safety net systems, you know, we have to get in there and sort of get into the breach where we know disparity is going to occur. And we did not do that adequately um, as a state. 
we had to fight tooth and nail to get uh, the eviction and foreclosure moratorium um, to get you know transparency and data collection uh, passed into law during the pandemic. And even since that law has been passed, uh, you know, signed, the Baker Plato administration hasn't been in compliance with it. I think for a single day. Um, so those are things we could have done differently. Um, you know, and then fast forward to now. Well, I mean, the pandemic, the vaccine rollout, right? We all remember the Hunger exactly. Games. Right, and the ways that that getting a slot, you know, getting an appointment for a vaccine in those early, you know, few months was was you know billed as a lottery, but it was really more like a raffle, uh, where you know all kinds of advantages, uh, structural advantages, got you an extra ticket, you know, or an extra ten tickets in the raffle. Um, and then fast forward to now, you know, totally predictable that we were going to see a spike in demand for testing around the holidays, right? When there would be a spike in transmission um, during the winter months um, and that we were gonna have more demand, you know, as folks came back from uh, holiday travels and to get back into school, we could have been much more prepared for that. And that those will be my, my guiding, um, uh, you know, principles going forward, even though we can't anticipate everything is, you know, proaction, right? Anticipate what is anticipatable and be prepared for it. And you know, be a partner with localities and businesses and families. So it's not just about standing at a podium and saying, "Be safe, everybody." You know, stay safe, get vaccinated, uh, keep your school doors open. But actually, being a partner with people and making those realities, uh, you know, come into being. Um, so, and then equity, 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 right? At every turn, in every consideration, you know, how can we be um, knitting this this disparity, uh, this gap closed? Okay, awesome. Uh, and thank you so much. So some of a governor's, but as you know, uh, from your work in the legislature, some of a governor's agenda requires legislative action, and some of it can be done by the executive branch alone. So what would be a top, let's say one kind of top priority bill that you would want to shepherd through the legislature in the early part of your term, if mm -hmm. elected? And then what is one thing that you would want to accomplish early in your term for which you don't need legislative mm -hmm. approval? Ooh, I love this. this is such a thoughtful question. Uh, so I'll say right off the bat, um, uh, universal uh, quality early education uh, is something that is going to take, you know, legislative uh, buy-in, right? Uh, we're going to need to set up, you know, both the funding structures um, and the um, just the legal structures for that. Um, that's legislation that I have been uh, filing uh, for many years now um, to yeah. extend, you know, our existing, uh, and we can use a lot of our existing pipes and our existing infrastructure um, at a minimum to extend our, um, our existing funding structures for K through 12. Uh, back to serve, you know, four-year-olds and three-year-olds. Um, and then I'm also a supporter of the Common Start legislation um, to make sure that, you know, from the zero to three years that we are making uh, uh, child care and early education universally cost accessible for families. Um, so that's one uh, uh, that would have to go through legislative approval and, you know, building those winning coalitions, right, to get things done, even mm -hmm. when they seem hard, is something you guys have seen me do in partnership with you, thank mm -hmm. God, uh, you know, over the past 13 years. That's how we got the Student Opportunity Act. Mm -hmm. um, on the executive front, I would say tackling climate change, um, you know, certainly there's more we can and should do legislatively, but there's also a ton um, that we can do, you know, through the powers of the executive branch, and that will begin uh, you know, right out of the gates by appointing people, you know, to the DPU, for example, the Division of Public uh, Utilities, um, who give a damn, right, about pursuing the agenda uh, of, of tackling climate change and transitioning to a green energy economy, um, and, you know, as well as numerous other appointments um, uh, throughout our, our energy and environmental affairs infrastructure. Great, thanks. Um, so here's a kind of a softball kind of get to know you question. Uh, who are your political role models and why? Um, so, um, you know, the, this is my heart's answer um, on this is that I, I gotta leave, I, I gotta not leave out the parents um, who you heard me talk a little about. They would not think of themselves as, as politicians, you know, or political at all. Like my mom even used to, she like, I would used to beg her, can we have a newspaper subscription as a kid? And she said, I don't want to subscribe to the newspaper. It's too depressing, <laughs> you know? So, um, but she never missed an election. Um, so, um, but I think, you know, the, what you're looking more for here is, is folks that you know, right? I, you don't all know my parents the way that I do. Um, although Zeta, you, you have that early, you know, knowledge. Um, so I would say, 
I would put Elizabeth Warren and um, John Lewis at the top of the list um, because of the way that both of them have, um, I think, come into government service uh, not as a you know career move, but as a um, with a with a true sense of mission, right? And mm -hmm. have fought tooth and nail. Uh, for the things that they believe in, and particularly when I think about the, you know the sweep of John Lewis's career, um, you know how he brought an organizer's sensibility and an organizer's methodology, you know, from the outside in. But even over you know that long sweep of his time in public office and elective office, never you know lost his way, never lost his anchor, never lost that moral fire, um, which is not easy, right? It, 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 it's it's a bubble, right, uh, in many ways in government. And so retaining that anchor to why you came in the first place um, is something that, um, you know, that, that, that brings John Lewis into my, into my you know, pantheon of, of political role models. And, that, and for both of them, people who have, you know, fought hard and accomplished real things that are having real impact in people's lives and that will outlast them years after they're gone from office. Uh, good choices. Uh, also for the parents. Uh, so let's say, so uh, somewhat similarly in vain, but what, which governors either in Massachusetts it's past or in other states right now, do you admire and why? And what would you seek to emulate about them or which policy ideas of theirs would you want to introduce mm -hmm. or build upon? Mm. That's a hard one for me, honestly, because um, Jonathan, I, you know, my political memory, in my political memory, we have had almost all uh, uh, Republican governors. Um, so, I, you know, in my political memory, right, I can remember Duvall and I can remember the Duke. And you can go to other states as well. Right, but, well, so other states, I just like, um, my head is in Massachusetts, right? So, um, uh, you know, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna say, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll pull a couple of qualities from both um, Governor Dukakis and Governor Patrick um, that I would seek to emulate. Um, you know, my, my memories of uh, Governor Dukakis as governor, right, uh, are, um, I was young, so, um, but I remember now, I have met so many people along the way who have gone on to continue their public service in various fashions, who got their start um, in the Dukakis administration and speak with such pride, you know, about their start in the Dukakis administration. So that's something that uh, I have actually always prided myself on as a legislator is the talent pipeline um, that we are pulling into public service. Um, and that, you know, one of my favorite sayings in, in, in activism is that if you're doing it alone, you're not doing enough. Right, so having an incredible team of people, you know, yeah. who populate your administration, who can get out there, you know, and, and, and like fight hard and organize hard and just like churn, 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 right? So that we can accomplish a lot of change on a lot of fronts all at once um, is, uh, you know, is a, is a quality that I would pull from the Dukakis administration and also not for nothing, just the leading by example, right? Like everyone I think has that vision of Michael Dukakis, private citizen, just like, or, you know, just picking up trash, right? On the town green. Um, so, uh, and writing the team. Um, and then uh, with Duvall, I just, I, I still don't know that I've ever uh, heard a more consistently inspiring orator uh, than Duvall Patrick, right? And who was not afraid to talk about his values. Uh, and that is something that I still think is a lesson that we as progressives are, you know, have to have to keep learning, you know, with each, you know, few years that, um, that we lose when we run from our values. Uh -huh. um, and when we, when, when we embrace them proudly and we fight for them, um, that is a winning strategy. Uh -huh. Great. Um, um, the next question, name one word that people who work with you would describe you and name one word that people who work for you would describe you. Mm. It's funny when you said, work with me, what I thought of was people who work for me. So I had to rejigger. Um, so by with me, I think you mean other elected colleagues? I, I, yeah, I mean, however you want to interpret it. And if it's one word to describe both, I'm fine with that as well. Mm -hmm. Whatever, however you want to interpret it. It's up to your interpretation. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to try and uh, merge and pull off a little, you know, cheat here. I, I'll merge the two and give you like, a phrase uh, rather than a word, which is ask a lot of questions. 
Um, and um, I think probably definitely my staff would say that, um, uh, you know, both on the campaign side and the state house side. Um, and I think probably also my my colleagues, my elected colleagues would say that. So on a lighter note, um, since during the pandemic, we've all ended up having spending with like far too much time at home. What is your the favorite binge that binge watch that you've mm. discovered during COVID? Uh, I, I, I'm going to go with the current, uh, which is um, uh, right now. Uh, my husband and I are um, in the middle of Ted Lasso, which look at that. You know, I have a love in common with Charlie Baker. Um, <laughs> reaching across the aisle. Um, but um, I don't know if any, for any of you who have, uh, you know, been Ted Lasso watchers, I just can't get the, the thing out of my uh, mind when he high fives the tree, <laughs> you know, walking out of the, the boss's office. And I, I just love that show. A broken clock's right twice a day too. Mm -hmm. So yeah, exactly. Um, and lastly, um, like I, during the pandemic, have done a lot of kind of like trying to reflect and recharge. Name a place in Massachusetts that you go to recharge your batteries. Oh, my bed. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that is a place in Massachusetts. Yeah. Um, uh, I have not, uh, I have not been there um, during the pandemic. Um, but I will say that the um, the courtyard of the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum is one, one of, of my favorite. Places, yeah, uh, one of my favorites. Places, you know, to um, find some peace and and, and reflection. Nice. nice. And then for our kind of our, kind of our closing question is: after you talk with a voter, how would you want them to describe you in one sentence? I think she cares about me and she has fire in her belly about the work of government. Nice. Okay, good answer. And then before we before we round things out, if people want to learn more about you and your campaign, where should they go? Uh, I will drop the chat in the uh, drop the link in the chat. Um, if you guys is the, is the chat open to everybody? Yeah, yep. Uh, <laughs> but uh Sonia Chang Diaz.com. Uh, is the um, is the main page? Um, I know there's some I know there's some nerds here, uh, which I say with love, nerd love. Uh, so there you go, Sam put it in. Um, so there's also an issues page up there that you can get to from the home page. And then um, Sam, if you've got it on, at your fingertips, I would ask you also um, to go to our delegate sign up page. Uh, if you are if this is you know a, a movement that you want to roll up your sleeves for, um, in addition to your support here at uh, Progressive Mass, we are organizing like heck. Uh, for the uh, for the caucus process uh, in a few weeks, so we'd love it if you would join us there. Awesome. Well, thank you, thank you so, thank you so much for joining us. Uh